Thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, my name is Calvin Carter. I'm the founder of Bottle Rocket. We're a mobile strategy and app development firm, and we're really passionate about innovation and what's next. Uh, we're here with some of the pioneers of virtual reality uh, to discuss how brands can engage customers better with VR. I'm excited about this topic because, uh, frankly, it kind of reminds me of the early days of mobile, uh, where our landscape was largely undefined, and a small group of curious and passionate people came together and defined a transformational industry. So what we're going to attempt to do today is to paint a picture of how VR and will affect brands and consumers in the coming year. Uh, I'm hoping to gain some insights and real-world experiences uh, from this group, uh, about, you know, including examples of what you know, has and hasn't worked. So with no further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel today. So on the end, we have Andy Mathis, Head of Business Development and Partnerships at Oculus. Andy leads mobile partnerships working with carriers, retailers, and developers to drive VR distribution and engagement. Prior to that, he worked at Google for seven years, growing Android to over one billion users. Lance Losberg is the founder and CEO of Big Look 360. Lance has an impressive track record with over 20 years of experience building interactive content and virtual reality. As one of the world's foremost VR experts, he pioneered the first immersive VR 360 video application for commercial use in 1999. Next, we have Matt Johnson, Executive Vice President and Head of Innovation for Bottle Rocket. Matt brings over 20 years of experience from the interactive media, casual gaming, and mobile app industries to his role at Bottle Rocket today. Recently, Matt led Bottle Rocket into new territory with innovative VR solutions for big brands like Colgate and Jim Beam and aims to change the face of enterprise learning and engagement with new platforms his team is actively working on right now. And finally, Paul Bettner, founder and CEO of Playful Corp. In 2008, Paul and his brother David founded New Toy to create the smash hit Words with Friends and change social gaming forever. In 2012, Paul founded a new game development studio called Playful Corp. Their first ship title, Lucky's Tale, is, is a terrific platforming adventure designed exclusively for VR and is bundled with every Oculus Rift shift. So, let's get started. My first question is for you, Andy. Andy, the Oculus Rift made its big debut this year. Uh, what do you see is the key success of the platform today? And then how might brands start to capitalize on this success today? Yeah, when we launched the Rift in March of this year, we were definitely enthusiastic about the possibilities, but it was a first major VR launch. And so we weren't sure exactly how it was gonna go. And thankfully, um, I'm happy to say that it, it, it's been a success. Uh, on a number of fronts, and we're just getting started, but really at the end of the day, content is what's gonna drive the long-term success of VR. And so we were happy to launch uh, with 30 titles out of the gate. As you mentioned, uh, Paul uh, and, and I, well, the companies between us actually launched uh, Lucky's Tale um, as a part of a bundle with the Rift, which was a great way to kind of get our users started on utilizing the Rift um, across, uh, you know, just a phenomenal experience. Um, how can brands start to utilize the sort of the momentum that started with the Rift? I think there's a number of ways. I mean, I think VR connects really well on a number of fronts in, in new ways, just as a brand new medium. I would say it drives empathy in a way that perhaps 2D environment doesn't necessarily accomplish. And what does that mean? So like if, if a charitable organization wants to reach their users in a deeper, meaningful way, VR provides that medium for them to really attach that brand and, and reinforce it in a way that, again, prior technologies couldn't necessarily accomplish. I would say also just the immersiveness of VR. So another example that comes to mind would be, say, an apparel company that wants to uh, you know, show an experience of a major athlete utilizing their apparel. In the past, you know, there's TV and, again, existing 2D mediums that do serve a purpose, but I think VR takes that to a whole other level where the user can actually be on the field with that athlete and literally feel like they're in the experience. And that, I believe, will serve to really reinforce the brand in a way that, that other mediums can't. And I think that's, you know, we're just getting started to that effect. Right, and also Oculus worked with Samsung to release the Gear VR. And so now, together, you've got 
what I would call, like, you know, uh, two very important parts of the spectrum from the high-end uh, 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 tethered headsets like Oculus to the lower cost, untethered, mobile-based headsets like, like Gear VR. Um, thinking about that spectrum and the other side of that spectrum from Oculus, uh, what are some uh, uh, recommendations you might have or could you talk about like the Gear VR and how that is a great fit for brands and how that particular part of the spectrum can be used? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been great to have the partnership with Samsung to launch the Gear VR at a price point that's really accessible to a lot of users that actually works well with devices that they already have. It's, you know, the mobile phone. And that has really helped to broaden the audience in, in, in an accelerated fashion, frankly. And we expect that to continue. In terms of how brands can utilize uh, that ever-growing uh, Gear VR base, I think you know, Gear VR is actually over-indexed compared to maybe what we expected in terms of video viewing. A lot of people are using the Gear VR to watch movies and uh, 360 videos and uh, just a range of, of video content. And that's a great opportunity for brands to take advantage of. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, again, I go back to the examples of brands creating uh, video content where users can be fully immersed. I mean, that, this is no exception, and the Gear VR just provides an accessible means to do that with. Awesome, thanks Andy. To, to add on to, uh, or at least enhance what Andy just said, is that from a content development side, there's always a challenge in creating 360 video or VR content is who gets to see it or who can has the ability to see it in this, in this immersive 360 world. So mm -hmm. with the Gear VR and Oculus obviously, but the Gear VR especially being make it mobile mm -hmm. is open up tremendous amount of uh, spectrum for, for as a developer standpoint. That's a great point, Lance. Actually, let's, let's dig further into that and talk about video content for VR. Uh, you know, you've, you've been producing 360 degree videos for 15 years, if, if I'm not mistaken. Longer. Uh, <laughs> longer than that. And, uh, but there has been, and that's why we're here today, there is a massive explosion in VR going on right now. How do you think that's changed the industry, and in, in, in spe specifically, you know, 360 video content? Right. But kind of more importantly, you know, what are like the new best practices or what are some of the new best practices based on current technology, the current explosion and the, the current interest with your purview of 15 plus years experience? Well, it, it's it, the, I guess with the advancement of technology and cameras and, and, and new capabilities overall, it's anybody pretty much can, can create a 360 video. So mm -hmm. there's always this dynamic between um, the consumer level or what anybody can produce to the professional level. So we're, you know, having done this for so long, we, there, there is a differenti differentiation depending on the tools that you use and then the way the content's created to, to make that difference between uh, more of a professional uh, type mm -hmm. of piece of content. It's, it's pretty not that, that much different from what you see in a movie or, or television commercial or, or something in that respect. So it, it's an approach um, of, of what to, how to take or, or con concept the, uh, what the content's gonna be like and then all the way through the production cycle from how you shoot it, the way it's processed, and, um, and then obviously the way it's formatted and presented in a, an immersive environment. That makes a huge difference difference watching a 16 by nine screen mm -hmm. as it putting somebody inside this world. It's a whole different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. I bet the concept of writing a script and what a script is is totally different when the script is in fact at least partially influenced, if not helped, you know, de defined by the viewer and his or her uh, perspective they take dur during the experience. Now, absolutely. I mean, we, we, we continuously are, it's, it's an education, uh, I guess, uh, path for us for working with clients or people that are trying to create content um, in that you have to think totally different because a lot of times they're standing, they, the traditional methods, though, where I can stand behind the camera or I can put lights over here or cables or, or things that way. And it's the, when you shoot 360, it sees everything all the time. So the approach is totally different. And the way of thinking is, is kind of out of the box in, in, in a way. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, big name directors we worked with, we had to say, no, you can't do it this way. And they're used to doing it a certain way. So you have to know that they're going to see that, that kind of as, as the most simplistic way. I think Lance brings out a good point, too, to think on, which is, you know, at the beginning of whether it was the web or whether it was mobile, I mean, you have this upstart of people that had had the, the iteration before them of experience to carry with them into the new one, right? And you see this big difference between the people that are able to produce that content based on that knowledge and the quality of it. So as brands are seeking out, hey, what do I want to put my best foot forward, you know, seeking out groups that have had 
you know, multiple years of experience in this type of video production is really important. You know, otherwise, you know, the consumer's market is coming. It always does, and that will get better and better as the tools improve and the processes improve. But, you know, brands, I think, need to be thinking clearly that, hey, if, if it's meaningful for me to put a, my best foot forward and have a good quality experience, you're going to have to lean on the, the tried and true production methodologies of, of groups like Big Look. Excellent. So let's talk about experience design. Uh, you know, Paul, you know, obviously, Playful is one of the one of the most respected game development studios in, in the gaming space. Um, in regards to great user experience design uh, for VR, uh, you know, what recommendations do you have for designers or developers in producing just a phenomenal user experience for VR? <clears throat> so I think this kind of builds on what you guys were saying. The, the key that, uh, that, that we've seen um, in the work that we've been doing in VR now as designers is to really be able to put aside our assumptions from working in previous formats, previous media, previous platforms. Um, <clears throat> the best way to describe that actually is to make an analogy to the work that we did on mobile prior to, to VR. Because we, we as a company, uh, we've kind of gone through these two major shifts, and you were kind of alluding to that earlier. In a past life, I was developing games and designing games for Xbox, for TV. We made this huge shift to mobile. And what we saw is that there were several companies along with us making that shift at the same time. The most successful companies were the ones that were willing to kind of put aside what worked before for them on previous platforms, previous formats, and, and truly embrace what worked on mobile. So in our case, you know, the example was when we were developing Words with Friends and the With Friends brand, <clears throat> we were obsessing on this new concept uh, of convenience, which was all about how fast does the app launch. I know you guys were focused on stuff like this too at the time. You know, can I get in there and make a move in 30 seconds? Can I, can I literally play a game? Can I design a game that can be played in two minutes? These were questions we had never asked ourselves as game designers before that because, I mean, it just took two minutes to power up your console and turn on your TV and all this kind of stuff, and you're settling back on your couch and you're engaging with, with the entertainment in a completely different way. This format <clears throat> created that new challenge for us. And I believe that, that our, the success that we had with Words with Friends was directly attributable to that. We actually launched as a brand after Scrabble. This is a 50-year-old, extremely well-established brand. Words with Friends launched a couple months afterwards on the App Store and you know, just, just completely took over in terms of brand awareness. Uh, and <clears throat> the reason is Scrabble as an app especially the first version or the version they had for the first year, if you went to launch it, they did all this stuff that the Scrabble app would do on your PC. So they'd load all these graphics and all this sound, all the stuff that team had to throw into the app. And it took about 90 seconds before the app would even launch. When we were developing Words of Friends, I was telling the team, it has to be as fast as Apple's email client or text messaging. Of course, I didn't know at the time Apple was cheating and they were keeping their stuff in resident memory and we couldn't even do that. But anyway, <clears throat> fast forward to to now with VR, and I'm seeing the same thing again. Now, convenience has nothing to do with VR <laughs> development at the moment, honestly, because you know, you're putting on this headset and you usually have a wire, and I mean, convenience is right out the window, so that's not the important thing for the platform at the moment. Uh, but some other things begin to emerge. So for me, right now, a big one is comfort. It's so easy to get it wrong, just like it was pretty easy to get convenience wrong on mobile, and you know, if if Scrabble takes 90 seconds to load, no, you don't even want to play it anymore because something interrupted you. In the case of VR, if you violate the, the relationship with the customer in terms of comfort, uh, then they might think that there's a cool novelty to it, but they're not going to launch your app a second or third time. Uh, and in fact, dangerously, it, it, they're, they're going to potentially distance themselves from the technology mm -hmm. uh, on a whole. So anyway. That, that's one of the things that we're focused on right now. But at a high level, um, my, my advice to other designers that are coming into this medium is be willing, you know, I love the word empathy earlier, be willing to have the empathy to your customers. And when you try things that you think would work because they worked for you before as a designer, um, you know, be willing to accept that they, they're not necessarily going to work the same ways or they may not work at all on this new platform. And the set of things that make for great experiences in VR is potentially a brand new set of things that we haven't seen yet. Let's dig into the comfort thing, because that's pretty interesting. Uh, talk about that, because there's the, <clears throat> there's the physical comfort of maybe hardware, but I think you're talking about maybe something else. Yeah, we're talk I'm, I'm talking about experience comfort. Yeah. So uh, in the case of this game, this is Lucky from our new game, Lucky's Tale, that uh, was bundled with the Rift. 
Um, we did a ton of experiments with Oculus early on. We actually were, were one of the, I think we were the first developer, external developer that, to work with Oculus. This was right when the Kickstarter was happening. Um, and our initial relationship was, okay, we don't know what's going to work here. And if it's anything like mobile, it's going to surprise the heck out of us. So, so let's just experiment for a while. So we did a several months of development with them uh, where we were rapidly churning out different experiences. A very, you know, very prototype-y kind of stuff. But, um, but what we immediately saw was comfort was a big issue. We could, we could easily create experiences, no matter how great the hardware was, we could easily create experiences that were fundamentally uncomfortable. And, and there was nothing Oculus or the hardware could do about it. We could, through software, immediately make someone sick. Um, conversely, if we focused on the right things, we could create experiences that were actually comfortable. And so we kind of explored this, this broad spectrum. In the case of Lucky's Tale, we, uh, what we landed on was completely counterintuitive, um, at least from a game developer standpoint, because what most of us game developers think about VR, we think about first-person experiences. The thing that comes to mind because it's virtual reality, so I'm in the, the eyes of the character. We did several experiments with that. Most of them ended up being uncomfortable because anytime you're in the eyes of the character and then the game artificially moves the character and you're not walking, it creates a disconnect between your inner ear and what your eyes are seeing. That's what leads to the inverse of motion sickness called simulator sickness. Um, we through those experiments, came upon the technique that we use with Lucky's Tale, which is a third-person experience. So Lucky, the character you're controlling, is actually this little you know, stuffed animal-looking thing right in front of you, and you're running him around. The reason that we, we kind of gravitated towards that is we saw in our experiments that, that <clears throat> if you as the viewer were focused on this, this character and the character wasn't moving relative to you, even if the environment was moving around you, uh, that greatly increased comfort. But again, not something I would have ever predicted or guessed about the platform. We, we arrived that, at that by doing experiments and just kind of seeing these things emerge that we didn't expect. Yeah, so that's a, a great learning. I'm, I think there's more that, that, that the panel can, can share, sure. right? Yeah. 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 Uh, it's like pioneers have to pack extra arrows <laughs> because they're going to be taking a lot of test shots yeah. as, as, as they go along. Yeah, so point, what are yeah, some yeah. test shots? Well, the DePaul's point, I mean, as far as the motion goes, because we do a lot of, a lot of projects where we have the camera's actually moving, and sometimes at high speeds, and you have to be very careful on how you do that, either low speed or high speed, whenever the camera's moving, it means we're shooting everyone's always in a first person perspective. So, um, you know, what goes on around, how it goes around, what, you know, even could, could be subjected to lighting, there's so many different variables that are involved, and the only way you know is just do it. Um, it there's no book, there's no handbook on yeah, it. No science yet. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what do you think nope. the human capacity is to adapt to those types of experience. I mean, can we start to push them forward as more and more people um, I, experience those in, in little bites? I, I believe so, um, but it's an interesting thing. So with Lucky's Tale, <clears throat> there's, it's not 100% comfortable. Oculus themselves rates it as a, a moderate, I believe. Yeah, and I'll touch on that in a sec. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I think we're really somewhere between comfortable and moderate, but there's only three levels of it, so we got moderate. Anyway, um, we've seen that 10% of people still will complain about it. They'll still say that it's not that comfortable. But it's an interesting thing because there's two categories, at least from our experience. And again, there's not science to it. But there's, there's a category of experiences that, that grow increasingly dis uncomfortable over time. Uh, and you, know, you can hang in there, but, but it's going to ruin your day if you keep doing it for a long time. Uh, but Lucky's Tale and some other experiences that I've, that I've tried, uh, they fall into this other category, which is it's a new sensation. And some people don't even want the new sensation. So that's the 10% that are like, uh-uh, I don't like it. They take off the headset. But, <clears throat> but it doesn't increase discomfort over time. You, you tend to actually get used to it in 10, 15, 20 minutes. And then, yeah, something happens in, in your brain. And the next time and the next time after that that you play the game, it becomes something you can't even feel anymore. Right. So, uh, but again, this is so subjective. And, and, and a note there for designers. Um, and, and I think you guys have probably seen the same thing. Because this stuff is so subjective when it comes to, com to comfort and, and experience, uh, we have to be extremely careful about the things we try. Because every new thing we try that we haven't tried before, we now have to sit 20, 30 people down and just ask them to rate this. Yeah. You know, we, we can't, like, I can't put it on myself and say, yeah, that's good. I think it's great. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I have a different sensitivity than other people. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're particularly sensitive to this, um, especially given the fact that Many times when a user picks up the Rift or the Gear VR, it's their first time in VR. So we really wanted to make sure that they were ready for what they were about to dive into, which is why we came up with a rating system and three mm -hmm. tiers of rating. I think it's comfortable for few, comfortable for some, comfortable for many. I think I got that right. Um, and 
it, we felt it was important for the user to sort of be ready for what they're about to experience and have certain expectations. So maybe if it was a little bit more, um, I, I would less comfortable than they necessarily anticipated, at least it sort of went in knowing that there was a chance of that happening. And they're more willing to try out new and different content to make sure they get the right content that's going to resonate with them. Yeah. That's a risk. I'd say we jumped into the deep end with our first engagement because it was with Jim Beam. And I remember talking to you guys, and you said, wait a minute, you want to do a roller coaster ride through whiskey <laughs> in a bar it's where awesome. people are drinking? I was like, hell yeah, I do. Let's <laughs> absolutely do that. So, I mean, much like you, I mean, we had to kind of figure out what are, what are the parameters and put a lot of people through it to kind of get a sense for what that is. Because two years ago, on the first uh, Gear VR, I mean, you know, we had to keep that frame rate and keep them mm. where they needed to be in order to even be viable in that, or we were going to suffer a lot of low bat, but it went well. And we learned a lot from that, and those techniques built on other techniques, and now we're able to, to add that to our experience set. Which so. is another very important part as, as far as the comfort uh, and the content goes, in that is the hardware capabilities, is the display, but also when we shoot in 360 is, is a frame rate. Um, and resolution, obviously, uh, but also the tracking capability of the head mount, head mount display headset itself um, can have a bearing on it, because if the, the tracking's not good, that's going to present vertigo mm -hmm. potential as well. And I think, um, to Matt's point, uh, you know, I, I, I do believe that you can push uh, further as, as, as this kind of evolves, not just with better hardware and software design, but uh, through, through greater acceptance of, of the platform. I mean, you can, I, I, I remember, um, I think we all remember, uh, eight years ago uh, with small, small screens on phones, people said like, well, I'd probably never really check my email on that. Probably never really surf the web on that. But I might do some small things here or there Snake. on my phone. <laughs> and now it's, it, it's everything. So I, I do think there is, there is significant precedence for um, where a platform like this can go, even if there are early obstacles. And uh, so that's, that's well, why we're here and, today. And that's another, th there's kind of another point there, which is th the evolution of these platforms is so rapid right now that mm. uh, even those experiences that, that we learn and we build on, they change. So as a, just as a casual example, the Gear VR does not have positional tracking right now. What that means <clears throat> is that if you, it, it works great if you're just sitting there in the most common experiences of just looking around. If you actually try to lean into something, the world goes with you, mm. uh, and it does create a, a little bit of a churning sensation in your stomach. What that means from a content designer standpoint is don't create, like, I mean, it's, it's subtle things, but for instance, don't put something right here that encourages the person to lean in and look closer at it because it's really interesting. Keep things beyond a certain distance, but that limitation which doesn't exist on the tethered headsets, will certainly not exist in a year or two on mobile either. So even those lessons are rapidly changing. Excellent. So let's talk about brands and how brands might be able to leverage all the great stuff that we're talking about today. Uh, Matt, I'd, I'd like to start with you if I can. Sure. Um, you know, Bottle Rocket's been building custom brand ex experiences for a long time and on VR for actually a, a, a while as well. And uh, since the original Oculus development kit was released, if I'm not mistaken, and you built everything from you know, virtualizations of healthcare solutions uh, to games to on-site marketing activations for Jim Beam, like you just mentioned. Why do you think now, or do you think, and if you do, why do you think now is the time for brands to be primed in, 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 in taking action? Sure. Well, I think it's largely about, as we've seen, uh, you know, moving from multimedia or CD-ROM to web or web to mobile and things like that, it's, it's kind of this pendulum. And you know, for the last eight and a half to nine years, we've had these great contextual in-the-moment devices where we could dive in and out of and get information from. What we've been lacking is really this, and I love the word empathy as well, but these uh, deep conversations that brands can have with their consumers, right? You could put them in, in, in a narrative, and I, and I won't forget, I mean, the first time I went into um, uh, Henry, which is the Oculus Story Studio, kind of thing. I, I mean, I, I've never felt like a kid since I was a kid um, <laughs> and sitting there and thinking, I'm going to have bedtime stories with my grandkids where I say, hey, check this out and sit down with Lucky and he's reacting to you. And it just feels like something completely new and joyful. And I took that headset off and I'm like, oh, wow, I want to go back there. I want more stories. I want more content. Mm -hmm. I had a relationship that wasn't distracted by emails coming in and texts coming in and all this kind of stuff. And that's important. And I think it's, it's important to note that the idea of virtual reality isn't to supplant mobile, it's to augment it in a way where you have different types of experiences 
for what the platform is meant for. And for me, it's about having a very immersive and, and, and lots of multiplayer stuff coming online is going to be very interesting about how we represent emotion. I've told you the story many times about my experience at uh, Oculus Connect a couple of years, or last year, I guess, when the touch devices were demoed for one of the first times, and I was doing toy box. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm, I'm sitting there somewhat following this, uh, instructions, uh, not really. But uh, the guy was like, pick this up, do something with it, and I had these hand controls. This is amazing. There was, a, there was another... Yeah, yeah, so someone, I think, might be in Menlo Park or something, was like communicating with, with me. Mm -hmm. No, he was next room. It didn't work. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh you <laughs> should have <you laughs> <should've laughs> my perception <laughs> of the magic, Paul. <laughs> so, anywhere in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anywhere so in the world. Yeah, that's the story. Nowadays, yes. Back yeah. then, I was right <laughs> at the beginning. It was you, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I so <laughs> they had him rigged up so you could see kind of... Uh, it's a little bit of shoulders. It wasn't the full legs or whatever. But there was a motion through See, the that, inverse kinematics. Funny. Actually, that. it was just the head and the hands. But because it is oh, so impactful, yeah, you, right. yeah, your brain fills in the rest of okay, it. Okay, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> and my brain was filling in the idea that this person, because uh, I could tell they dropped their hands in a way which was the shoulder drop, because they were like annoyed that I wasn't going through the experience correctly. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I got pissed for a second. And then I was like, wait a minute. That was it. That was the moment that I realized that I'm gonna have, I had a digital experience that I never had before, right? I felt an emotion that I never had on a rectangle before within this immersive environment. So I was like, man, if brands can start to communicate with their consumers in a way where they're completely focused, non-distracted, and can communicate in that very emotional way, this is a game changer. They just need to figure out how to put that into their, their mix. That's really interesting because what you, you, I, to me, I heard a story about a very human thing. Right. You know, that the, 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 the subtle nuances in our body language and things like that. And that was communicated in a virtual reality experience. Yeah. So and I, I heard a great story from some of the developers that were working on that when they were first testing it out. And again, it is literally just a floating blue head and, and hands. There's no, uh, the, there's no uh, scan of the other person. It's the same head model for, for whoever puts it on. When the developers were working on this initially, <clears throat> they did a test where they had... Uh, they had two, they had a person, uh, a wife of one of the developers actually in there ex testing it, and they had somebody else pick up the other side. And, you know, initially you just see this head lying on the floor because that's the headset there, and then <laughs> the head kind of lifts up. And the moment that, it, that the person puts it on, you're like, oh, it's a person. And then what happened is the person didn't speak. And, and eventually the, the woman, after just like a few minutes, is like, is that you, Frank, or whatever his name is? And it was her husband, and he didn't say anything. <laughs> and just through the body language of the head and hands, she could tell that yeah. it was her husband. So, I, I mean, and this is a stunning thing, and this is the very dawn of this technology. All right. There's two, there's two points <clears throat> I would make as far as brand, uh, brands go that they should be aware of if they're not already, but what virtual reality environments or these worlds do that the people experience or experience them um, is better comprehension. So they, they're doing it themselves, or they're seeing or feel like they're there, so they understand it a lot better and easier, and enhance retention. They'll remember it for a longer period of time than any other medium that exists, except for if you do it in person yourself. So those two things alone, I think, are very important for brands to, to understand. Just one more point I'll add, too, is that VR is brand new. I don't know how many people in the audience have actually used Gear VR or Rift. Or in Okay, so this a lot of <laughs> this is of a particular them. audience. This is a particular <laughs> audience exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think the general public is obviously quite different than than this population, but it, there there needs to be something that recognizable for the mass audience to bring them into VR. Because as you guys have all experienced, I think once you've tried it, you know what it means. We can stand up here or sit up here and talk about it all day long, but it 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 doesn't really come to life until you actually try it yourself. So you guys understand. There's a lot of people out there who've never tried it. It's got to be something to bring them in. And big, recognizable brands is a great way to do that, I think. Especially if they're creating experiences that, in and of themselves, aren't just a promotion, but they're an experiential that stand on, its, that stand on their own merit and bring the people in and make them want to come back for more. Yeah, and that's it's a bolstering your point earlier of like that first 15, 30 seconds, whatever it is, is so important, not knowing if that is their first experience of, of what they're engaging in and what they're seeing, because it's not like, I mean, we struggle. I'd be, love to hear anyone's opinions about how you get feedback from someone that's in VR. On the high end sets, obviously, we can output it to a screen and kind of get a sense of what they're doing and seeing, but like on the Gear VR, it's, you know, how are they reacting? How are, what's what's happening yeah, in, what in their seeing? space? What are they yeah. seeing is one of the big challenges. <laughs> We're in mobile, it's like you're over their shoulder 
and seeing what they're tapping mm -hmm. and, and where they're doing mm -hmm. it. So we have a, a big kind of a usability, I think, mm -hmm. challenge ahead of us. Uh, you know, I think the tech, like Paul said, will get there in terms of advancing to the point where we can solve those problems. But yeah, I, I'm just, that's what I get nervous about. It's just like, I don't know what someone's first experience is. I can't be a part of that with them. <laughs> you know, how do I make sure that that's solid? Because this could be, and that's the opportunity too, right? For Jim Beam, that was their big drivers. It's like, I want to be the brand that introduces VR to people. But it's really important to get it right at that point because it could be the experience of like, yeah, I hate Jim Beam and Devil's Cut sucks because, <laughs> you know, they they put me through a bad VR experience. Right? <coughs> that's a great point because from yeah. the content production side is, is you don't know which direction somebody's going to look. You are you have a sphere that you're able to look right. anywhere. You know, one person's looking this way, another person's looking that way all at the same time. So when you create the content, you have to understand that this exists and not everybody's looking the same direction all the time at the same time. Right. What about usability testing? Uh, any, you know, uh, lessons learned in usability testing? Uh, because if you believe in the think, make, check cycle, come up with an idea, <coughs> make something that you can test quickly, and you know, in, in an agile format, and then check it, test it with users, test it with you know, um, informally or formally. What what are some like best practices, or even best practices, lessons learned? Like what didn't work, what did work? You've already talked about one where for certain platforms that don't have positional tracking, you know, someone had to do that a few times before they figured out, you know what, we should probably not put things mm -hmm. so close uh, to, to, the, to, to the user on this particular platform. Things like that that might, or, or, or how usability labs have been, had, had been retooled or re retrained. I think it's particularly difficult right now. There's, there's this effect that always happens when you do traditional or usability testing where, especially on a new platform, we saw this on the iPhone too, People are so gee whiz about the technology itself that you kind of get false <laughs> positives. Um, this is especially true in VR when you're testing with people that haven't experienced it before, and they won't tell you that they're feeling uncomfortable. They don't want to, you know, <laughs> admit to that. It's a physical sensation. It's personal. It, you know, so so it's pretty difficult to to uh, to get accurate results right now. Honestly, I think when the when the population becomes more. Uh, familiar with the technology and more people have used it more often, then people will be willing to, to call a spade a spade there, but it's, that's, that's one of the lessons or challenges that we face right now. That's a good point. That's a good point. So Andy, um, we were talking about brands and how brands could use the platform. Has anything come out, you know, uh, on the Rift that surprised you? Maybe good, maybe, maybe, maybe not so good? Sure, sure. <laughs> I think the biggest surprise for me has been the pace of innovation and sort of the pace of if not adoption, right? It's early days, so I'd be overstating it to say, you know, it's it's wide adoption. It's not. Gear VR has got a, a nice, solid base and growing fast. Uh, Rift, it, Rift as well. But I think back to when I first started my career in mobile in the year 2000. It took three to five years for some of the more basic, you know, games and apps to start really resonating with consumers. I mean. You could make the argument that it really didn't truly become mass until 2005. Yeah, Candy Crush, Clash of Clans, those were not, they weren't there for the first three right. years of mobile. That's right. So I was, you know, toiling with, you know, developers and mm -hmm. doing things that I thought were great, but nobody really knew about it yet. It took five years. I mean, here it's like, what, m we launched the Rift in March, and I don't mean to plug, it's just I think it's a good example, um, you know, with, with Henry, uh, Oculus Studios won an Emmy. That's, I think, symbolic of there's this understanding by the mass audience that this is real and it's going to resonate with consumers. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of how quickly. That's happened really fast this time around. And I think it's kind of fun, right? It means that we're going to be able to parlay the early successes into something bigger. That's been the biggest surprise for me. Excellent, excellent. So. Um in talking about brands, we could talk about the, the B2C and consumer facing. And if we've got other, <clears throat> uh, other discussions about consumer facing, let's just you know, jump in. But let's also talk about enterprise as well, using VR in the enterprise. And Matt, I'd love to start with you because you've got a, a real uh, passion for how mm. the, you know, the face of the enterprise can, can be changed through VR. Yeah, I think that's where it started for me. I mean, obviously, I love games; uh, very exciting to me. But you know, when I first put on the Oculus, and that's another moment. It's just when I got the the DK1 in the mail. I remember I came back. Of course, it arrived during vacation, and I come back. And it's been waiting there for me. But I put it on. I was like, for the first time in 20 something years working in digital, I didn't really know what to expect when I put this down. But when I when I came out for the first time, and I think I saw that. 
uh, villa thing, the oh, Tuscany right, yeah. villa, mm -hmm. which made me throw up when I went up the stairs or down the stairs. <laughs> uh, I thought, well, but I get it. I could see the future that, you know, while it's going to take a while, like Andy's saying, for a consumer market to really develop over time, there's this immediate opportunity for enterprises to be able to use a technology that they haven't had really practical access to for, well, ever. Right, so the idea that the Boeing's of the world, the U.S. Army, you know, groups that have in invested hundreds of thousands, not millions of dollars, in building specific rooms for their application, that's now kind of been democratized with platforms like the Rift, and they can say whether it's a trade show or a corporate headquarters or a training center, now I could build an application that teaches my product in a new way or shows my product. And I like the idea of even like helping the bottom line. Let me think about a trade show where. I have heavy equipment that I got to move in and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars putting it in. Can I now bring in one tractor and then virtualize my whole line of tractors and then augment that experience to have even a better way to communicate the value proposition of my product? That's what I get excited about. So a lot of what we're working on is tools to, for people to have better communications, talking about the problem of not knowing what you're seeing in VR. We're developing tools of like, from an iPad, I can look in and see different views from the user's perspective and command and control certain things or put flags in the environment to lead them down certain paths. So we can have a five to 10 minute experience at a trade show booth to take someone through a, a product experience, right? And to me, that's like, okay, well now I saved several hundreds of thousands of dollars, it makes sense and I can afford to pay for this content development or advance this platform. So I'm really excited about things like that where brands can use this to promote traditional products in, in a new way and give it a plus one because, you know, at a, even at a trade show, I'm sitting here showing you something on an iPad or on a digital signage or whatever. I'm just I'm looking at my phone. I'm doing all these kind of things. I'm still not there. Right. So the power of that message going deep, uh, I, I think, is going to be very valuable to to the enterprise as well. It continues to be a, a theme in all our discussions about w one of the one of the secret weapons of VR is that true and deep immersion, mm -hmm. and the um, cutting out of so many other distractions. And then you pair that together with uh, the ex the fact that it's experiential. It's it's just experience, and we retain more, learn more, mm -hmm. and are better activated by things that are experiential <coughs> versus reading something or listening something or being told something. So I was uh, I just had a conversation last week with um, a fellow that runs a flight safety group at the American Association of Pilots, uh, and he was you know we had met up. Uh, because I'm a pilot too, and we were talking about this VR stuff, and he had been thinking about it, and he was asking me, you know, okay, well, this seems like it would be really an ideal technology for things like accident reconstruction, or mm -hmm. you know, if you guys have seen the the Sully movie, where they're in the simulator and they're they're sort of re redoing something that happened and trying to see how it plays out, and what was fascinating in that conversation with him is, he, you know, it, I was like, you know what, you can actually just go buy a Rift right now and download this flight simulator for VR that's out right now, and for $1,000, you can probably have the most accurate flight reconstruction that you've ever experienced in, in your guys' organization today. And, and you know, he, wasn't, he just wasn't thinking about it that way. He was still thinking mm -hmm. about it as, oh, this is going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. and this kind of stuff. And I'm like, no, nope, actually, the flight simulator is there on the store right now. You just go download <laughs> it, and you'll be sitting in a 747, and you won't believe how incredibly realistic it is. Mm -hmm. so. To Matt's point about the bottom line is, uh, is about about 10 years ago, we did a project with Choice Hotels. They built a new concept hotel uh, for the business traveler. It was called uh, Cambria Suites. And the first one they built as a prototype was in Boise, Idaho. I don't know why they picked Boise, Idaho, but that was the place they put it. So they wanted to do is we shot actually a uh, 360 tour of the hotel, and we had staged you know, people behind the counter welcome you, and we took you all through the rooms, different type of rooms, took you to the restaurant, the whole the lobby, the whole setup. And it was like a four minute tour. And what they used it for was their sales reps would go out to companies to encourage them to stay at this new grand hotel. They also used it for potential investors to buy the concept so they could license it out around the world. And you know, it was kind of like a, well, let's see what happens thing. And it was so successful for them. They renewed that same content for five straight years. And they just added more, you know, more units to it so they could have the people go out, put on the headset and say, mm -hmm. we don't have to fly you to Boise to see the hotel. We'll take you there, and uh, it was very effective that way. 
Yes, and sales enablement. Really obviously, there's a huge yeah. opportunity for that as we've worked with a lot of groups that have, like I mentioned before, massive products that are very complex. I mean, if you can create a tool that can both sell and teach um, yeah. at the same time, I mean, there's a hu huge value to powerful. an organization to do that, right? Very powerful. Yeah. In medical, the, the power of visualizations, I think, is, is amazing. You know, one of the biggest issues in healthcare is uh, the patient's compliance with their, with their care plan. And many times, patients don't understand um, how a drug or a, a procedure impacts their body and works in their body. And if they can be shown a visualization of a drug working inside, for example, let's say inside the chamber of one of their hearts, or one of the chambers of their heart, um, and seeing how that drug over time is improving that condition. First off, that feeds the mind over matter uh, component of, um, of, uh, of getting better in healthcare. But it also is going to obviously help a patient understand, it's important that I take my pill every day at three. This is an important <clears throat> thing. I have bought in this. I could see this ha having happen. What other things are, what other uh, things can we uh, be thinking about in terms of the power of visualization the power of someone being able to see something happen that they've never been able to um, see happen before because of some sort of scale or location or, or capability. How can visualizations really kind of drive um, uh, brands forward? Uh, I get to, uh, once again, this, but we mentioned our first 360 video we ever created was with General Motors back in 1998-99. And it would, we, because it was the only 360 video we had, we used it as our demonstration tool. And we had a dragon, you know, Pelican cases of equipment, take two hours to set it up. And we put people through a virtual test drive of a, a Buick LeSabre around the country. And they, we, in it, we know we um, had indications of you know, automatic windshield wipers and heads up display, and these little features of the car as you're taking this ride through the country, the Pacific Coast Highway, and, and New York City. And inevitably, we're showing people the technology of this, this brand new you know, technology, this virtual reality. You can look around, take people's heads, and physically make them turn. And inevitably, they always come out and they go, I didn't know Buick had automatic windshield wipers. I didn't know they had heads up display. I mean, so <coughs> you can deliver these messages in such a way that's so powerful. And, and that isn't, this isn't even the intent of, of what you're trying to do. I mean, we weren't, nobody was trying to sell them a car. It was just, it was one of those things. And that's, and it became very successful in that, in that respect. That's just another powerful way to, to deliver these, these messages. I, I mm -hmm. think of a company called Forklift Simulator. They're a startup that's building uh, software that enables users to train on how to use a forklift and talk about powerful for major companies, retailers, uh, construction companies. It's sort of, I don't know, consequence free environment to learn how to use a forklift. And because it, it, there is that true feeling of <clears throat> presence and that deeper level of interactivity, they're actually learning how to use a forklift. It's not that they're being told by a video or they're having to dive into a forklift and actually do this thing. And if mistakes happen, think, you know, that's high cost. There's, there's uh, health and safety issues there. They're in VR. So they can screw up and try again. And they actually do learn how to use this forklift. And that, that can be applied to so many different industries and, and verticals. Yeah. So it's pretty exciting. And, and I'll add, I mean, I think another powerful proposition of that is having types of analytics that we necessarily haven't had on, you know, mobile or, you know, desktop or anything like that, of like knowing where the user is looking for how long, creating heat maps, those kind of things to understand whether it's putting together a retail environment and understanding where the best place to put signage or something like that is around it, or whether it's, you know, doing stuff like you're talking about of like, well, the reason you wrecked the forklift is because you're looking at the, you know, something over here at the snack bar over there or something <laughs> like that. You know, we can have a better story that's told through that experience. But to hit on healthcare specifically, we actually finished a uh, recently engagement for Colgate where um, they're thinking about it, Paul and I were talking about it a second, they're like the year 2030. I'm thinking like, can we do this next year? This is, this is close. But uh, the idea in this, uh, this demonstration was, you know, we'll, we'll have accurate ways to scan the teeth at a consumer level, whether it's some kind of advanced toothbrush that can scan the mouth. So if there's a problem, uh, for example, the, the user would scan their teeth, send it up to the cloud, which could maybe pre-process that data and kind of look at it based on their record and understand there's four potential problems 
with the teeth, then that gets could be brought down to virtual reality, whether that's ultimately a mobile headset they could use while they're away from the office, you know, golf course or something like that, or whether they go into, you know, higher end virtual reality and are able to manipulate it with their hands. We've created this visualization of now taking in the data of this teeth and the doctor can look at them accurately from each side, pull them apart, kind of see what the, the cavities and things are, and then make, you know, agreements with what that AI had determined as potential problems and, and do a course of action chart right there from virtual reality. Otherwise, it's going to be, you know, three days before we can get you in and it's going to be, you know, yada, 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 yada. So I think looking at tools of like how, how do we enhance the decision making ability uh, of, of brands and or healthcare or whatever uh, through the virtualization of, of certain objects that they're typically using, right? That's awesome. I, I'd love to talk about uh, live events and live events in 360 video. Uh, Lance, you've done a lot of these. Uh, you've got uh, a ton of experience there, and as you know, we, we, from, the, from the NBA NBA finals to the presidential debates, there's a ton of stuff being 360 uh, streamed, live streamed. Uh, what do you see is, like, where are we going with that? What's, like, the next step? What's the future of, of live VR broadcasting? Well, I, in my opinion, the future is unlimited. Um, the, it's, it's opened up a whole new avenue of bringing a venue or an experience to people who either couldn't afford to get there or geographically unavailable to get there um, or it just doesn't exist. So it can be created in, in a bunch of different ways. Um, the barriers are, are you know, internet bandwidth, ac accessibility, which is key in any VR kind of, a, a, as far as content goes, is you know, where can you place, in our case, a, a camera or camera system? Um, and how close to the action, because it has to be close. Um, and, and where is it effective? I mean, if you can't enhance or augment or better give better value than a traditional conventional TV production or, or film, video, whatever, then you know, if you don't need to look around, what, what good is it? Uh, you're not going to make it better than what, what are, what's already there today. So that's, that's the other you know, at, way to, to, to look at what, it. Where, what are your thoughts on how that stuff improves? Like, so I, I saw this article. I didn't get to watch it, but it was a football game that was streamed recently. And, uh, in VR, and <clears throat> this article was kind of critical because, you know, several of the viewpoints were like, there was one that was on, technically on the 50-yard line, but there was a line of people standing in front of it, and it's like, great, I can look at the back of these people's heads, I guess. I mean, it, you know. Yeah, I mean, and, that, and that's, that's exactly it. So the, the, the challenge we always have is, um, is number one, is, is location, because you can only get so close to action in certain sports. Um, football's tough. Mm -hmm. uh, in respect, because everything looks far away. Um, from, you can't you can't zoom in with yeah. you know, yeah. the camera, so you're set at a, at a focal length. Uh, if you're maybe hanging from the, which we put it on a crossbar, it's kind of a cool shot. If the play is like inside the 10-yard line, mm -hmm. and if there's something happening in the end zone, it's a great shot. Mm -hmm. um, the but also is too is that you the it's like any other production is, uh, especially in live events, it's difficult because you can't control the environment, what's going around. We've done concerts and like the Billboard Awards, we've done Emmys and Grammys and Oscars. And you're right, unless you have somebody, and I've physically gone up and said, excuse me, can you move a little further away? <laughs> because you're blocking, you know, there's somebody at home that's, that's looking around and all they see is your, your face or the back of your head or, and, and, or other parts or whatever. So, you know, it, that's, that's, that's part of what you have to live with. But in the same token, it's almost like real life because in real life, you're going to have some guy who's going to stand in front of you or somebody's going to cut you off. So, you know, there's, there's a trade-offs. It, it, it is as close to real life as you can get, but you can also, you try to orchestrate it so the experience is a little bit better than, than some of the bad stuff you would experience. Curious if you'd agree. Um, I think there's also ways to complement live events with, say, behind-the-scenes footage, right? So you can go in the locker room pre- and post-game. You can go behind the stage before a concert, and you get, in essence, as a user of VR, a backstage pass to hang out with Aerosmith and... Steve Tyler, right? And you're right there and he's, you know, prepping and you can see the bead of sweat on his forehead and it's just, it takes you to a place that you couldn't go otherwise. I also am very excited about sort of how the live events progresses and I'm hopeful that uh, VR is considered sort of by default a part of the production mm -hmm. of these live events and I think that'll help because you will get to a point where you can have cameras where you want them right. and move around with the action in a way that's comfortable for the user. Well, the, the challenge now is that the, the, the networks are paying billions of dollars for the content rights for the NFL, the major footballs, and, and even you know collegiate football or basketball, or sports in general in, in that case. And then entertainment <coughs> because of music and concerts. And, so there's a licensing rights issue. Who owns the content? And that's, that's where it comes into play is that 
you know, well, we can't use, you know, we can't do anything internet-based or, or, you know, online kind of stuff, or yet even talk about 360. Who owns that? How is it going to be handled? So that's a whole other ball to be, to be reckoned sure, with and that kind of sure. thing. And like you said, the other part of it is it, as be part of the production, because we've always been the so-called bastard child. We're always piggybacking on a TV commercial or, or some other production, and, oh, don't get in the way of that, you know, of that camera. Don't get in the way of this or, or somebody else's things. We're always, well, how do we hide what we have? And oh, by the way, you know, where they're using one camera, we're using a cluster of 12 or six or whatever our array is, mm-hmm. and we have multiples. So that, that's always the challenge from that perspective. And you just do what we do the best as you can. And, and, and fortunately for us, we've been successful in doing it. But you know, there's always going to be nuance. Sure. And it can always get better. Yeah, and that's course, a, it's, it's unlimited. In, indeed. And I, I think that's a here and now challenge. And you know, I, th- I believe that as brands start to adopt this and show how this technology can be used in a meaningful way, other brands will get on board, brands like NFL or mm-hmm. NBA, in a, in, a, in a more holistic way where you know, VR is just a part of the production. Right. But you know, great progress to date, though, of, of all these sporting events uh, across the board. It's been exciting. It, it, it opens up a whole new audience to, to whatever that content is, um, whether it's a concert or, or a sporting event or whatever it may be. Uh, there were people geographically, like, as I mentioned earlier, couldn't get there, exist, or other parts of the world, or just you know, who, how many people can afford to sit in the front row of a concert or, or you know, a special event, and now you can do it at home, you know, for free or a small fee or whatever, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a great experience. So speaking of progress, um, Oculus, you, you continue to make great progress, and there's going to be some news around the corner uh, with the um, Oculus Touch controllers that have been announced, and it's uh, to be, to be um, launched here pretty soon, actually. Uh, so that, of course, it allows you, actually, maybe you can talk to Alex, but what, what is sure. a touch? And then, n- then segue that into now what can designers and developers be doing to the, with this heightened uh, sense of presence, and maybe specifically brands, and how, mm-hmm. how they might be thinking about this, this, this additional dimension in, in presence. Yeah, so, so we did announce earlier that Touch will, will launch uh, the latter part of this year, and we're excited about it. And Touch, in essence, introduces, uh, <coughs> as the name indicates, the ability to hold and manipulate objects and throw objects, and that, again, adds an immersiveness and an engagement to the overall VR experience. And, I think the, the, you know, I think there's so many different possibilities that brands can utilize to engage. One example that comes to mind to me is like, say, take a museum, and think about the fact that maybe 80 to 90 percent of the items of a museum are archived, maybe collecting dust in a basement. Those are all incredibly high-value items that could serve to educate users in a very, very effective way. With touch you'll be able to actually, and again, I'm thinking ahead, but think about you know, museums you know, digitizing those objects and uh, offering them in a way that users could actually pick them up and turn them around and look at all aspects of the object itself. That is going to have the effect of really, I would say, reinforcing the education of what that <laughs> object is about in a way that 2D just can't. I mean, a museum could put a number of their objects that are in their archives on you know, a website, it just doesn't have the same effect as when a user can actually manipulate the object and interact with it. That, I think that's a powerful thing that brands can utilize. And that, the same would go for, for brands of any of their products, right? Touch enables the brands to um, really introduce a means by which users can interact with the product. Instead of just you know, broadcasting a message, which is effective and important, you're also <coughs> introducing this interactivity that will really reinforce the message. We talked earlier, Matt, when you were talking about the, um, uh, the, that social experience that you had mm-hmm. uh, with, when, the, when the other guy uh, you know, dro- dropped, his, um, dropped, dro- dropped shoulders. his shoulders. Yeah. So, and this question's for everyone, but I'm, I'm gonna start uh, with, with, you, with you, Andy. So Mark Zuckerberg has been very vocal about his desire to make VR the next big social platform. You know, what is, what is Oculus's viewpoint on that and their vision? And, and how does that roll out? You know, we've got snaps, we've got tweets, we've got likes. What is that new VR paradigm going to be? And how does that roll out for us? Yeah, I mean, we, we do see social as um, an important part of VR's evolution. And, and it's already starting to happen. <coughs> the more obvious scenario is multiplayer games which are out there today. 
and the, the portfolio of those multiplayer games are, are, is growing. And that's social at the end of the day, right? So that's a good start. Uh, th another thing that we could think about is imagine that there's a shared room where people can go and share actually uh, through an interactive experience with the avatars that you mentioned, right? Where they're sharing photos and videos and discussing those photos and videos. Mm -hmm. And because they're in the same room together and they could be anywhere in the world, um, doing that sort of thing, it, it just it expands the audience uh, in an exponential way, and that social element really will, we believe, drive retention <clears throat> of the use of VR. So we, um, <clears throat> we're doing a lot of research in this right now, and we haven't announced anything, but mm -hmm. we're spending a ton of our energy and, and effort on social VR, and the reason is it, it's crossed this critical threshold. You know, we, we've all read, well, not all of us, some of us, many of us have read science fiction that has described these sorts of uh, universes that might exist in the future, you know, whether it's Snow Crash or recently the really popular Ready Player One that Steven Spielberg's making a new movie. They describe these, these metaverses, these virtual worlds. Uh, in my opinion, the technology that now exists when, when you plug it into a computer and you have the touch and you're fully in there with another person has crossed this threshold of it's basically there, or at least this is the dev kit for that thing. And, and we can start to build those experiences now with very few compromises. And when you're in there with someone else and you're sharing an experience, even mundane things, we have a, an experiment that's just, you walk up to someone's house and knock on the door and they open it and they invite you in. That's just this incredible thing that you can't believe you're experiencing. And that's it, there's nothing more to it. Uh, but, you know, and, and just so, so that the impact of social in VR, I think, is is probably beyond uh, any other types of experiences that, that people will be having. And, and I think Zuckerberg is right. I think it will be the predominant way in which most consumers are utilizing VR in the next you know decade. That's excellent. So we've been talking a lot about virtual reality, but I would love to get um, some uh, some viewpoints on augmented reality. How does that sit within this this realm of uh, that that we have in front of us? And you know, maybe help the audience understand like where one might, you know, be strong and what were the strengths of each, or how can they be mixed together? You want me to start? <laughs> I'd love to hear your <laughs> answer. <laughs> um, you know, I, I I see augmented reality. Um, or I should say, we see augmented reality as as a complementary technology. I mean, uh, you know, it, VR is definitely here and now, and is going to grow fast. Uh, maybe AR is a little bit further out, but uh, we're eager to to see and help support um, new applications that utilize AR. But I, I just think it'll further enhance the experience and 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 really enable the user to kind of have access to both sort of what's in front of them with AR, but also be immersed in a completely different world that could be anywhere with with VR. I just see them as as yeah. highly complementary. Yeah. I too, to me, it's interesting, even though, yeah, what you're thinking about, like HMDs and the full vision of, like, uh, you know, was it uh, Magic Leap or whatever their promise is of what's coming in, the, in that field, it almost seems to be it's going to be, that's going to be the stepping stone for people to really, truly adopt VR that are the, the laggards. It's like once they can kind of have that stepping stone experience of, like, digital holograms or content within their world and they become more and more comfortable with that, they're okay to become fully immersed in the opaque nature of virtual reality, right? You know, and so I, I think you experience it somewhat on a phone right now to a certain degree, and it's a novelty, I kind of feel, to a certain degree with that, with the exception of, like, geolocation and pointing or out. Or Pokemon. Uh, that wouldn't go in there. Exceeds. That's, that's yeah. your statement, not mine. But <laughs> that has definitely gone past the novelty yeah. stage. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, and and really, that's that that's a component of Pokemon Go. Yeah. But the yeah. true engagement there is location-based yes. gaming, yeah. right? So it's 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 a supplement to that. But I but I think that I that people and especially in the business and enterprise look to augmented re reality as being okay i can understand i want to be in the real world and engaging with people in a way i'm familiar with but put something on top of that that's either surprise and delight from the entertainment side or augmenting or bringing in data that that's meaningful to me to look at it i think product design and collaboration i mean be careful about all the videos you watch. A lot of them are produced and, and marketing in terms of that. I mean, they got a big field of view problem to solve still in terms of augmented reality for a headset. 
but the idea that I could be looking at one product and people could be standing around it and we can be sharing some, something in each other's heads up display and talking about how we're going to design that product, powerful, powerful use case. And we see some, I, 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 I love Till Brush. I mean, I, I am a terrible artist, <laughs> but I could spend hours in there just thinking that I'm creating something amazing and as you transfer that to augmented reality and make that a shared experience that you know can mesh with the real world and become mixed I think there's going to be a ton of great applications for that. So to Matt's point, I think there's, there's applications for both. I mean, for sure. VR and AR, I think there's some things that are better suited for AR and some are better suited for VR. Um, and I think there's just, you know, it's nice to have an answer you know, one, one way or the other. I think you just have to examine you know, what, what's the message? What, what is it we were trying to deliver? What do we want people to experience? And then, you know, pick your path and you have the options now. So, so honestly, um, <clears throat> one of our greatest challenges as VR developers is the fact that to create great VR content, you have to create something that is worthy of someone's full attention. <laughs> and and this, is a, this is a huge challenge. It's not that it, it's insurmountable. Look at movies, books. Those are full attention types of experiences generally, although really you can put a book down, pick up your phone, and then put, pick the book back up. VR doesn't have that right now, so, so the experiences have to be worthy of, I'm, I'm going away, I'm going into this experience. AR solves that problem. And th there's no doubt in my mind that, that AR is, is truly the, the final platform, the, the most important, most impactful <clears throat> multi-billion user platform. But the, the thing is, there's too much of a dichotomy in the way people are thinking about this right now, in my opinion, as, as oh, there's VR and then there will be AR. Honestly, the reality of it is, both technologies are converging on the same point. The, our friends that are doing AR development are creating headsets that if you turn the lights off, they're VR headsets. <laughs> and and right. the work that the, the, the VR companies are doing is adding cameras and pass through and, and they're, they're all going to end up in the same place. And the distinction between the two experiences will be just that based on the experience you want to have. Do I want right. to be fully immersed in the world, partially immersed, there's yeah. mixed reality or not immersed at all and just have these these objects showing up, yeah. uh, you know, and I, I think it's just going to be a spectrum and there won't necessarily even be two categories of devices. They'll just right. be a single device that is able to give you those types of experiences based on the venue and what you want your, that experience to be. That's awesome. That's very cool. Well, with that, I'm going to thank everyone for uh, a, a terrific event. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming out today, and thank you all for sharing today. So hello everyone, this is uh, Matt Johnson from Bottle Rocket. We hope you enjoyed watching the panel discussion uh, as much as we had uh, creating it or making it. No doubt it's an exciting time to discuss what's here in VR and what's coming for brands in the space. So during the discussion, we had a few questions come in um, during the stream. So I want to dig uh, right into them and give our perspective, but if there's others, please feel free to add them to the chat box and we'll try to get to as many as time allows. So first we have a question that says, which headsets should brands target first or should they be on first? And for users, which headset should they target for finding the content they want? Uh, right now it seems very fragmented and siloed. Yeah, definitely, uh, I think there's a case to be made, probably as we talk about it in the spectrum from on the far left or lower end, you have something like Google Cardboard, 
which is more ubiquitous and, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of people actually have that in their hands today because it just takes their own phone all the way to the high end, which are these relatively expensive when you talk about having to connect um, a tethered headset to a PC, but the experience is so much more uh, engaging and deep and emotionally connected. So I, I usually recommend that if you're looking to reach a wider audience, uh, definitely looking for cardboard type of experiences, but focusing it around 360 video. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to just be video, though. Some very interesting things can be done with combining CG and video and uh, getting creative with the input, which is mainly, if you want to hit the lowest common denominator, look-based input, meaning I look at something for a certain period of time and it activates. But I think there's a lot of innovation happening right now on how do we expand 360 video and look-based interaction to create uh, some more depth to campaigns instead of just passively looking around them. And then on the high end, I think that uh, the opportunity is engagement like we've never seen before uh, on location or on site. So you think about an activation that uh, someone might set this up at a trade show booth or at a conference or an event and be able to draw people like a magnet into it to see something that they could walk around and engage in something, create something, share it with their friends on social media. There's, there's a lot of cool campaigns that have been done uh, that way as well. So I think the answer sort of it is, you know, both. I mean, the, the, the place that they're going to find content depends on what type of user they are. Usually the gaming communities lead first and they're heading towards the high-end headsets like the Rift and the HTC Vive now because they want deep engagements. If you're looking to hit just consumers that are more passive and have their phone and want to dip their toe into what it is, I think cardboard is still a good answer. Moving up to Daydream, which uh, Google recently announced. All right, so uh, the next question is, how can brands use uh, VR and AR for public relations? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think that PR in itself is built upon the, the, built, the foundations of engagement and relationship building. So you think of anything that, uh, as was talked about in the panel, of uh, driving empathy or understanding uh, for a brand or a business or where it's at uh, to create that content. And you know, a lot of great stories have been done by the New York Times and others uh, on global reporting for crises that are happening around the world that put you in the shoes of another person to really understand uh, it from away or see it from their own eyes uh, that you might not have had before or it was very difficult to communicate on paper form or uh, a rectangle form in terms of traditional 2D content. This could put you in the middle of, of an event or something that happened or uh, within an, an environment or a business or a company to understand who they are, what they stand for, and uh, what their processes are. So I I think it's going to have great use in, in public relations in order to connect consumers to that brand uh, in a more deep way. Okay, uh, so a question came in that says, do you have advice for content create creators making experiences? Who is doing it best right now? <laughs> well, if I can't say Bottle Rocket, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I think that you have the big gaming companies that are really focused right now on saying, how do we get um, those early adopters or those uh, really engaged gamers, um, you know, adoptive of the platform? Today, the PlayStation VR came out, and that's going to be a really interesting uh, telling sell of how quickly this industry is going to evolve because I think there's close to 27 million PlayStation 4s uh, in homes right now today around the world. And with the uh, relatively low-cost headset, they have the prime opportunity to get uh, in front of VR and have lots of content. I think they're supposed to relate, release about 50 games before the end of the year. Um, you know, I, I think that the advice that I would have, though, is really start, don't, don't try to overdo it. Really start with a very simple story. A lot of times people want to not spend more than five and ten minutes at a time uh, with bite-sized pieces of content, especially with you know, 360 video or narrative type things. You know, interactive engagement is going to be significantly longer. But, you know, if, if you're going for 360 video, try to tell your story very succinctly. If you're going for high-end activity, um, you know, I think that um, 
you know, doing something more in depth where their mind is taking off or, or removed from the idea that they're wearing a heavier headset and that they're uh, probably being laughed at by the people that are in the room with them. And they're engaged in an activity where they're using their hands and doing things like that. Okay. Uh, the next question is, what specific skills uh, should those hoping to get into the VR industry focus on right now? That's a great question. Um, our shop actually has been using Unity for about uh, 10 years, um, and that's been kind of the it's become the industry bellwether in terms of creating uh, experiences for both PC, Mac, but also uh, mobile. Uh, it's a it's a huge platform for creating games and content on that. Uh, any anytime you can get into uh, that engine, that or Unreal is another great one that's used in the industry. I, I think the skills that we look for are who are great UX designers that can translate from those flat type experiences into 360. What's incredible about this is the environments are, are all wrapped around you. Um, it's a whole new paradigm that we have to figure out. I mean, what works? There's this concept called the near field where things that are about two meters in front of you are the most compelling. But like Paul mentioned on the, on the panel is, uh, you know, you have to take considerations as to mobile things without inside out tracking or without positional tracking. Um, are just going to frustrate the user because they're just going to keep moving like a carrot dangling in front of you. They're just going to keep moving in front of you as you lean towards them. So thinking about which platform you're going from or, or you're going for is, is really important, but the skills are, are traditional to what you would have in normal software development. I mean, we're looking for good 3D engineers. We're looking for, uh, you know, graphic artists who can ride the line between great looking content and performant uh, type things. And, user experience designers who are fearless because they have a whole new palette to work with. Okay, uh, here comes a question from Twitter. It says, do you think that phone-based CR has a wider potential audience than PC anchored headsets? Are these totally different markets and what are the perceived benefits for each? Uh, another great question. I actually, yeah, I'd say they are, I would categorize them as kind of two different specific use cases for each, which you talked about just a minute ago, um, but certainly think that's the ultimate wide audience, and that's what uh, like Google with Daydream is really hoping for, is they're introducing a, kind of a reference design for a headset that sits in between the cardboard, which is designed to use with pretty much any device. You're just going to have a varying experience depending on the power of it. It's something like the Samsung Gear VR, which is very focused and tailored to the Samsung Galaxy and Note lines where you actually dock the phone into the headset and use some of its uh, capabilities for tracking as well. The, the Daydream doesn't have any docking capabilities, but it has a reference to other handset manufacturers that says, this is the specs that you need to have for the phone to produce a good quality VR experience. So I, I think with that, I'm hoping that a lot of handset manufacturers will adapt to that and there'll be a, a really good mobile, solid mobile VR market over the next year. What I think eventually is going to happen, and if you saw in the news from Oculus Connect last year, is they have a prototype, I believe it's called Santa Cruz, where it's the idea of how do we take the best of the fidelity from the tethered or the plug-in uh, end on the high and combine it with um, you know, the mobility or the freedom to move around and experience with that inside-out tracking, meaning I can walk around a room and it knows the structures so it can protect me from hitting something while in movement, but give you that ability, like we're talking about a minute ago, to lean in and look at different objects and things like that. Once you combine those two, that will ultimately be the mobile device of choice. Now, whether that's going to be streaming still from a PC, all the content just as a visual experience, or whether that's going to be an actual computer like the HoloLens built into your headset, I think that remains to be seen, but at the rate that technology gets smaller and faster, I think within the next two to five years sometime, we're going to see that one device that might even be uh, augmented reality built into it as well. It could be like one of those devices that was mentioned in the talk that goes from 100% transparent for normal viewing of the world to 100% opaque for a full virtual reality experience. Okay, so the, the final question here is, it says, audio is as important to creating believable VR presence as the visual component. This is inherently different from film audio mixing as it introduces the obstacle of interactive perspective. 
what are some available tools and methods used for creating 3D soundscapes? Well, that's a great question. Unfortunately, I am not the, the audio expert in the room. Uh, I know there's a term called binaural audio that I've become uh, up to speed a little bit on and the idea that positionally it, it works really well in VR um, uh, to kind of draw your attention to things. So I'll speak from a design standpoint. I think audio is incredibly important when you talk about the idea of drawing people's attention to the whole um, 360 degree view. Because a lot of people, when I put them in VR for the first time, I mean, I have to remind them to move their head. They just stare directly forward and expect the experience to come to them, which is understandable given uh, how we've delivered them in the past. Uh, but audio is a great way to, uh, say if it's off to your left side, make a little noise or a sound or a character starts speaking and it draws your attention to look to the left and explore new visual content there. So using that as part of the driving engagement within a VR experience, uh, I think is incredibly important. And I know there are uh, lots of sound tools out there that integrate with these engines that I mentioned a minute ago uh, to, to kind of create that great immersive uh, audio experience. Okay, uh, that is the majority of questions that I have at this point. Just want to reiterate, I appreciate everybody uh, joining uh, the, the call today and uh, would like to offer out if you have any more questions uh, for us, if you email hello at bottlerocketstudios.com, uh, we can certainly get it to the right place. Um, we appreciate you tuning in and listening and hope everyone has a great day. Thank you very much.